In this video, we are going to first consider the particles that are emitted during a spontaneous nuclear reaction. And these are sort of in alphabetical order, according to the Greek alphabet. But one type of particle that's emitted is an alpha particle. And so the Greek letter for alpha is this symbol. And since the mass number is 4 and the charge is 2 on this particle, that is the same thing that a helium nucleus consists of. So a helium nucleus has two protons and two neutrons, so its charge is a plus 2 and the mass number is also 4. So an alpha particle or a symbol for a helium isotope are used interchangeably. And remember, this is just the nucleus of helium, not the entire atom, including the electrons. Another particle that is emitted is a beta particle. So the Greek symbol for beta is that symbol. And a beta particle has a charge of minus 1 and a mass of 0. And since an electron also has a charge of minus 1 and a mass of 0, uh, remember an electron has negligible mass. Neg so its mass is technically not 0, but I like to think of an electron's mass being the mass of one hair on your head compared to your entire body. So we can say that the mass of an electron is zero. And another particle that is emitted during a nuclear process is a positron. And a positron is actually a positive electron. So that sounds like an oxymoron because we're taught that electrons are negative, but it's a particle that has no mass and is positive. Gamma is not really a particle, but uh, gamma is really pure energy. So the gamma particle, we would write the Greek symbol for that, gamma. It has a charge of zero and a mass of zero. So this is really the pure energy. And this is emitted during any type of nuclear process. So gamma radiation, if we looked at a spectral uh, pattern in the book or we looked at a picture of the entire electromagnetic spectrum, we would see that gamma radiation is on the very high energy part of the spectrum and as opposed to radio waves down on the low energy part of the spectrum. So in nature, low energy is good, high energy is bad and dangerous. And gamma radiation uh, this pure energy, this accompanies every nuclear reaction that is spontaneous. So emitted for all nuclear processes. We're going to see that we don't have to write the gamma particle, we might call it a particle, just like an electron is sometimes a particle or a wave that acts like pure energy. We're going to learn in a, another slide about balancing the equation. So every equation, the reactants, the sum of the mass numbers of the reactants has to equal the sum of the mass numbers of the products. And so same with the charge. The charges on the products and the reactant side must be equal. So we don't really need to show this gamma radiation because it does not add to the mass or 
the charge. It's also very useful to write the protons and the neutrons. Oops, let me shut my phone off. It's useful to write the protons and the neutrons in the isotope symbol form. So I'm going to do that as soon as I figure out how to turn my phone off. I'll, I'll do that in a minute. So a proton, just a good old proton that we've learned that exists in the nucleus, we may write with a P and a proton has a charge of one and it weighs one atomic mass unit. We could also write this as the isotope symbol for hydrogen one. Again, this looks like we're talking about an atom of hydrogen, but this would be the nucleus only. So hydrogen one, remember, would have no neutrons. So its mass number is one because the one proton uh, is all that is included in its mass. And a neutron will write as an N. It has a charge of zero and it weighs approximately the same as a proton. So these are not um, emitted during a nuclear process, but Oftentimes, protons turn into neutrons or neutrons turn into protons inside the nucleus. And so when we're balancing nuclear equations, we're going to want to make sure that we uh, keep the mass numbers and the charges with each symbol. And I think I'm, the next slide I'm going to make a chart that summarizes each one of these uh, processes, but what I would like to discuss first is the stability of a nucleus. So a nucleus we know has protons and neutrons, and protons repel each other. Uh, so hydrogen, the first element, only has one proton in the nucleus. So that one proton really doesn't require any neutrons to keep the protons separated. It's a lot more complicated than that. That would be uh, a topic for maybe nuclear physics. But a nucleus is stable, uh, let's just say up to calcium, that is atom number 20. If the protons and the neutrons are approximately the same number. And as a nucleus gets heavier, there's a lot more protons inside the nucleus, so that repulsion force gets greater. So after calcium, again, that's atom number 20. So if we looked at the periodic table, we might see the symbol for calcium to look something like that. So the atomic number for calcium is 20. That means calcium has 20 protons. More importantly, that means the nucleus has a charge of 20. And we can see here that this is the weighted average of all the isotopes. So it appears that calcium's most common isotope would be the isotope that has uh, equal numbers of protons and neutrons. Remember, that's the protons. This number, when we subtract from the mass number, is the neutrons. But after calcium, a nucleus requires more than, uh, re requires more neutrons. So the nucleus requires a neutron to proton ratio. So I'm just going to write it like that. I can't spell today. Proton ratio. 
that's greater than one. So in other words, after we are looking at atoms that are heavier than calcium, if we just compare, if we look for example at uh, zirconium, I'm just looking for a number that whose mass number is almost a whole number, zirconium has 40 protons in the nucleus, but the difference between the weighted average of all the isotopes, it looks like zirconium's most relative abundant isotope has 91 uh, nucleons in it. So if we look at 91 zirconium and put its mass number here, we see that zirconium actually has 51 neutrons. So we're going to see that when we look at what's called the belt of stability. So uh, after calcium, for a nucleus to be stable, the protons, or the neutrons, excuse me, need to outnumber the protons. And then any atom past bismuth, heavier than bismuth, that's really starting with polonium. So polonium and higher, all nuclei are unstable. So all of these atoms will undergo radioactive decay. And I'm going to look at the belt of stability are unstable. So if we pull out the periodic table again, polonium was named uh, after Madame Curie, her country Poland. So from atom number 84 and up, all of those nuclei are just too large to be stable. And so everything from polonium on undergoes nuclear decay. So we have something called the belt of stability and I'm just going to write that on there. So the belt of stability is just a graph like X versus Y or Y versus X. So the belt of stability we have protons along the x-axis and neutrons along the y-axis. And we'll see up to 20, there's pretty much a one-to-one -one ratio. So the slope is one. After element number 20, which I didn't plan that out very well, the slope gets greater because of this concept that we just talked about. After a nucleus has more than 20 protons, for that isotope to be stable, that's going to require extra neutrons for that. So on the next slide, I'm going to give us examples of each of the types of decay.